My name is Leslie Laredo. I'm the Client Relations Manager at Granite Harbor Advisors, and I have the distinct pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. First, we have Dave Allison. Dave is a nationally recognized certified financial planner, investment advisor, and enrolled agent admitted to practice before the IRS. He is the president and founding partner of Prosperity Capital Advisors and Valor Capital Management, two national registered investment advisors that collectively manage over 1.75 billion of clients' assets. He is also the founder and CEO of Allison Wealth Management, where he and his team deliver comprehensive wealth management, investment man management, tax management, and estate planning to a broad range of high net worth clients. Dave has become a thought leader, speaker, and industry trainer on holistic financial planning, including specialization in coordination of taxation and investments, equity compensation, such as stock options, business equity, incentive stock, restricted stock, and employee stock purchase plans, as well as retirement income distribution planning. Allison Wealth Management it has offices in Palo Alto, California, Charleston, South Carolina, and Littleton, Massachusetts. Allison Wealth Management serves clients all over the United States by offering virtual meetings. We also have Brian Sack with us today. Brian is a managing partner of Granite Harbor Advisors and has multiple professional designations in the areas of financial planning, life insurance, and asset management. He serves as the executive, or on the executive board and is the past president of Forum 400, one of the industry's most respectable associations. Brian's extensive knowledge and experience have made him a sought out speaker in the industry for many years. Brian enjoys leading the firm at Granite Harbor Advisors and has a true passion for helping families live their best lives. At Granite Harbor, the collaborative team brings clients through an educational process while creating and implementing comprehensive retirement and wealth transfer strategies for affluent families, business owners, and executives all over the country. Most importantly, Brian has unique ability to make the complicated seem simple and fun, so clients feel more confident in making financial decisions. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dave and Brian. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Leslie and Brian. It's awesome to be here with you. And uh, I love the last sentence of your bio, right? Making the complicated, simplified and fun. And uh, certainly life insurance can be complicated. So we're going to try to simplify it and make it fun today. And what we're going to talk about in our time here is strategically leveraging life insurance within your financial plan. There's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstanding about life insurance. Unfortunately, it's also one of those financial products that can be missold. And so what our goal here today is to help educate you on how you should be thinking about life insurance within your financial plan, no matter what phase in life you are in, whether you're just getting started in your career or whether maybe you're phasing down, winding down your career and thinking about retirement or somewhere in between. And so the first thing that we wanna do in talking about insurance is start to break down some of the basics. Some of this stuff you might know already and some of the concepts that we're gonna share with you, maybe you've never heard of when it comes to life insurance. But at the very basic, there's essentially two types of life insurance available for all of us. There's term life insurance and there's permanent life insurance. And this is the starting point for your own personal journey into how life insurance could fit into your financial plan. The first area that I wanna to touch on is term life insurance. So a couple of basics around term life insurance. The first thing is it does just what it says. It provides life insurance for a specific term. Most of the time we see that term either be 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years. And after that term, your insurance generally expires. Now I say generally because there is a disclosure, you could pay a much, much, much higher premium after that term expires, but most people don't do that. Now with term life insurance, it only pays a death benefit during that pre-established term. 
So if you purchased a 20 year term policy and you live 21 years, there is no death benefit. And so we look at term life insurance as a pure protection play. You have something that has some sort of financial protection that you're in need of for a certain period of time. And I'm gonna talk about a couple examples of that in a little bit. Another characteristic of term life insurance is some policies may provide some disability benefits or long-term care benefits while you're alive, but the necessity for those things would have to happen during the specific term. And last but no, no, not least, with term life insurance, you build no equity, right? Think about your home and buying a house. When you buy a house, you build, an, uh, you build equity up. From an insurance perspective, equity is known as cash value. With term life insurance, you build no equity, you build no cash value. It's purely for the protection of that death benefit. Now, one of the common questions we get with insurance in general is, well, how much do I need? And this is an interesting question because you know, Brian, your firm, my firm, we work with some incredibly high net worth clients and you might say, well, why does a high net worth client need insurance? And we're going to talk about that later. But most people think of insurance when they're just getting started. They're launching a business. They're starting a family. I like to look at this evolution of us building wealth and financial freedom. Think about the next 30 years of your life. At the zero down there in the bottom left-hand corner, maybe you don't have a large investment portfolio or net worth but you have things that would need your financial support if you were not here. Maybe you have mortgage debt. Maybe you have student loan debt. Maybe you have a young family that you're the primary breadwinner for. And in that case, you have a need to ensure the value of your life and your earnings, but maybe you don't have a whole lot of money yet. So you wanna ensure that need at the lowest possible expense. You know, Dave, I just want to, I want to jump in right there and say something because you hit on something really important. There's this concept of human capital versus financial capital, right? So when you're first getting started, you've got a ton of human capital in the form of future, in the form of future earning power. As you continue to grow throughout your career, your human capital goes down, your financial capital is going up. So we'll talk about the role that insurance plays in both of those scenarios. Absolutely. I love that. And particularly for anyone on this call, think about the investment you've made in your own education also, right? Ensuring that if God forbid something were to happen to you early on in your career, uh, the impact to your family. But the reality of it is over time, we all are going to continue to build up more and more wealth and maybe the protection side of insurance reduces. And so one idea is to ladder these term life insurance policies. Think about it this way buying three policies. If you knew for the first 10 years of your future from today on, we needed $3 million of protection. Well, maybe what we do is we buy one term policy with a million dollar death benefit for 10 years. Simultaneously, we buy a 20 year term policy for a million and a 30 year term policy for a million. And what you can see is as those policies expire, your net worth and your financial soundness has continued to grow. You might have less of a need for the protection and it's dropping off at appropriate times. And this is one of the ways to be able to maximize the protection and death benefit at the least expense out of pocket. Think about a 43-year-old female, non-tobacco user, in pretty good health, gets a preferred rating. A million-dollar 10-year term policy costs as little as about $400 a year. When we double the term length, it goes up to about $710, and if we triple the term length, it goes to about $1,200. So for about $2,200, $2,300 a year, you could secure the peace of mind for your family, for your business partners, for the people in your practice that you could have $3 million of death benefit. And as you continue to build up your net worth side, your asset side of your financial statement, some of these will drop off as you don't need them.
The other thing with term life insurance is not all policies are created equal. This is going to be a concept you're going to hear from Brian and I a lot through the training today and the education today. There's a lot of different ways to design insurance. Not all policies are designed the same. This is something that takes a lot of people by surprise. They think, hey, if I go buy XYZ company's policy and my neighbor goes and buys XYZ's policy, they're going to be the same. And it really depends on design. Now, when it comes to term life insurance, there's two important things to look at. Number one is, does it provide you the ability to convert it to a permanent policy at a future time without having to go through medical underwriting? Here's an example. Let's say you buy a 20-year term policy and 18 years into it, you're diagnosed with a serious form of cancer. The likelihood that you live five, six, seven years into the future is not looking very good with that diagnosis, but the likelihood that you'll live another two years is high with the advancements in medical technology and research right now. That would be an example where it would behoove you and your family to convert that term policy into a permanent policy so that if you did live beyond the remaining two years of the term, you had that death benefit protection. The other thing that we look at is if a company allows you to convert that term policy into any of their products on the market at the time, or if there's limitations. Again, more limitations to you, just restrict options. And so you want to understand what those options are. Now, if we contrast that to permanent life insurance, a couple of the things with permanent life insurance is that it's never going to expire as long as your policy does not lapse, meaning you fund it appropriately and you pay your premium on time. The policy will pay a death benefit whenever death occurs. The likelihood of any of us passing away within a term is statistically low. It's protection for those what ifs. But the likelihood that we're going to pass away at some point in our life is pretty high. <laughs> I know with the majority of my life insurance, I want it to pay a death benefit when I pass away, which is why I have permanent life insurance. In addition to the death benefit, which would protect my family, my children, my loved ones, it also builds equity. It builds cash value, which can be used while you're living. Income tax-free. And so we're going to talk about some of the tax benefits of permanent life insurance. If you were to become disabled or you were to need long-term care, nursing home, assisted living, home health care later on in life, you could typically access the death benefit on a lot of these newer policies for care while you're alive. So again, one of the big misconceptions of life insurance is it only is there if you die. But today, we see life insurance playing a pivotal role for the living benefits that it provides while you're alive. So Brian, why don't you just kind of walk us through some of the different types of permanent life insurance and how you would think about them in terms of risk and return and sure. uh, internally how they work. Yeah, absolutely. Just to put a bow on the term insurance conversation that you did so well on, you know, there's a reason why you can buy so much coverage for so little cost. And it's just that likelihood that death is going to occur during that term. Really, in, in reality, about 2% or less of term policies actually pay a death benefit, whereas 100% of permanent policies pay a death benefit, assuming they're enforced at death. What a lot of people don't know, however, is that not all permanent policies are created equally. Just like any other investment that you place your capital into, whether it's cash, bonds, CDs, derivatives, equities, real estate. You guys are probably very familiar with a lot of these things and their risk return profile. Life insurance is no different. You've got a risk return profile associated with different types of permanent policies you can buy. So if you're very risk averse and you're not willing to take on a lot of the risk associated with the transaction, you may be more attracted to something like Guaranteed Universal Life or GUL for short. It is literally the safest type of permanent structure you can purchase because the insurance company is taking all of the risk. You as the policyholder 
are taking none of the future unknown risk. As long as you're paying a premium by the specified contract that you purchase, the insurance company is obligated to keep those same terms and conditions in place. Then as you start to step over towards the right, you can choose to take on a little bit of the risk in the form of how interest is credited to your cash value. Maybe it's not a guaranteed interest. Maybe it's a floating interest rate. Maybe it's tied to an underlying index, or maybe it's even tied to sub accounts that are invested in market securities. You have all those types of options available to you when you're choosing how much risk and return is comfortable for you and is most appropriate for your specific risk profile. So it's important to understand that not all permanent policies are created equally and you, you actually have the ability to choose how much of that risk you can share with the insurance company. Absolutely. And Brian, you know, when we look at like why owning permanent life insurance in the first place, I can simplify it into these three different areas, right? We all know the general conception of life insurance is you put money in and then you die and your beneficiaries receive a tax-free death benefit, right? And there's a lot of advanced purposes for that. I know I own policies because I want to leave each of my three daughters money behind and an inheritance behind. Other people might be doing it for advanced estate planning purposes. I know that's a lot of the work your firm does, Brian. Um, the second is tax-free long-term care, right? We know Medicare only covers certain healthcare expenses in retirement and long-term care is not one of those. Assisted living, home health care, nursing care, these are massive expenses for a retiree as they age into their 80s or 90s and need some sort of specialized care. And life insurance can provide that leveraged long-term care that isn't the typical type of policy that used to exist on long-term care where you pay a premium in and if you never need it, you lose it. With life insurance, you get an acceleration of the death benefit. But if you never need long-term care, that death benefit passes tax-free to your family. And last but not least, tax-free income while you're alive. And you can see the one general three theme of all three of these benefits is those two words, tax-free. Life insurance is governed under the IRS tax code under section 7702, and it governs the taxation of these policies that are structured properly. And I think to walk you through that and give you some education on how you can use this tax to your benefit, it's important to take a step back and look at the tax code in the first place. So in the year 2022, I like to, uh, to use an analogy of a measuring cup with our income taxes. We live in a progressive pay as you go system, meaning the more money that we all make, the more in income taxes that we pay, but also the more money that we make, the higher the brackets are of what we have to pay. And so for all of us that take the standard deduction, now some of us might itemize if we have large mortgage interest or things like that, but everybody gets a standard deduction. The standard deduction is about $26,000, which means we all get $26,000 a year of income tax-free from the government. It's how about half the country does not pay income tax right now. Now from there, the next 20,550, if you're a married person, you can look at the right side of the screen. If you're a single person, you can look at the left side of the screen. But if you were married, your next 20,000 would be taxed at 10%. So you owe about two grand. The, up to the next 83,550 is taxed at 12%. The next 178 is taxed at 22. From 178 to 340, it's taxed at 24. 340 to 431, you're at 32. 431 to 647,000, you're at 35. And if you're fortunate enough to be earning over $648,000 of taxable income, every dollar above that is going to be taxed at a rate of 37%. Now, if you're at those higher income marks right now, you might be just complaining about taxes. I hear it from clients all the time. They're like, I can't believe how much income tax I have to pay. 
And I say to them, do you think relatively it's a large amount or a little amount historically? And everybody feels like it's a large amount, 35, 32, 37% of our hard earned income going to the IRS. But if we look at top federal tax rates historically, you can see by this chart, we are at some of the lowest income taxation levels that we've ever been at in the United States history. Look at the 40s and early 50s. We saw top marginal rates as high as 92%. Now, you had to make an awful lot of money back then, but it's a big reason Ronald Reagan only made two movies a year. He knew if he made three movies a year, he'd only keep eight cents on the dollar because 92 cents were going to go to the IRS for taxes. You can see by the early to mid 80s, we saw massive tax cuts. And today where we sit are some of the most historically low tax rates that we've ever seen. On top of that, in 2017, we had tax policy that lowered rates even further. We went from a top rate of almost 40% to a top rate of 37%. Not only did the rates lower, but you could see the amount of money that you could make, again, a married couple on the right-hand side, a single couple on the left, the amount of money that you could make went up. So somebody could make $600,000 and still not even be in the top tax rate. Whereas previously, before 2018, if you made 600 grand, you were paying about 40 cents on the dollar. Now, what's really important about this provision is it's what's called a sunsetting provision. Assuming Congress does nothing, which Congress these days have been pretty good when it comes to tax policies and not being able to agree on anything, this provision and tax cut will sunset December 31st of 2025, meaning tax rates are going to go back up. And so there's an incredible amount of proactive planning opportunity because of this tax policy. But how does all of this fit into life insurance? And I thought this was a life insurance uh, educational event, not a tax event. Well, the two of them, in our opinion, go hand in hand together. Because if you think about it, as we build wealth, as we're saving, as we're accumulating, there's really what we call three funnels that we can put our money into. There's a pre-tax funnel, which is where we get a deduction today to put money into and put our savings into. It's things like your 401k, 403bs, IRAs, cash balance plans, pension plans. The reality of it is if we put money into those plans, we're making a bet that tax rates will be lower in the future. Because as we put money into these plans and then that money grows because we're investing it, when we go to take that money out in retirement, that money is gonna be fully taxed at ordinary income rates. And the government can change those rates at any time. Many economists, many tax policy experts, including myself, think that tax rates are going to have to nearly double in order for us to keep up with the national debt, the interest on the national debt, and the entitlement programs such as Social Security and Medicare with 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 and going on those programs every single day. Now, the exact opposite, uh, opposite of that is our tax-advantaged funnels. This is where we don't get a deduction to put money into these things today. It grows tax deferred, but when we take money out later on in life, it's income tax free. We've removed the government from being able to tax this money. The most well-known one, hopefully you all own one of these right now, is a Roth account, a Roth IRA, a Roth 403B, a Roth 401k. I absolutely love Roth accounts because your money grows tax deferred. Hopefully it grows to a big pile of money. And then whenever you want to use it later on in life, it's income tax free. You also have health savings accounts in 529s that share this characteristic. But the third account that not a lot of people talk about that shares this characteristic is permanent cash value life insurance. The money that you put into permanent cash value life insurance, assuming you structure it properly, comes out income tax free to help supplement your retirement needs later on in life. And then the middle bucket, the middle funnel is your post-tax money. This is where you're actually double taxed. You get taxed when you earn the money, then you go and invest it in things like brokerage accounts, bank accounts, and real estate. Hopefully that money grows in value. And when you sell it, you're taxed again. 
generally at a capital gain tax rate. Now, because you're double taxed, the IRS gives us a break. It's a preferentially taxed rate at 0, 15, or 20% plus state tax, plus potentially other taxes like a net investment income tax. But again, you're taxed twice and we don't know what those tax rates will be in the future. And so one of the things that we think about when designing a tax efficient retirement income plan is we wanna leverage that pre-tax funnel, the 401k, the IRAs and the pensions in retirement to take income out at those lower levels, like a 10% and a 12% bracket. That's where we would construct your income stream from those taxable accounts. But for those higher brackets, once you retire, we don't want to take money out of an IRA or a 401k at the 22, 24, 32% bracket, particularly if tax rates double on us and now they're 44 or 48 or 60% tax brackets. So we want to have some tax-free money to be able to take our supplemental income at those higher levels. Where do we get tax-free money? Well, we have Roth accounts and some of us have the ability to fund those. We also have cash value life insurance, but it has to be designed properly. And that's where I want to turn it over to Brian. Brian, you're an absolute expert at designing some of these. So you want to walk us through how you think about policy design on life insurance. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the funnels. It does such a great job of understanding how your money's taxed. And I think that one of the key things worth mentioning in that tax advantage funnel is life insurance happens to be one of the only things in that funnel that doesn't have a catch, right? So Roth IRAs have to be used for retirement in order to get that tax-free treatment. 529s have to be used for education to get that tax-free treatment. Life insurance by nature, as long as it maintains the characteristics of life insurance, access to that cash value is tax-free regardless of the purpose. And Brian, it's also one of the investments in that category that has no IRS cap technically on it. You're going to talk about some restrictions or some Absolutely. planning techniques, but it has no IRS cap on how much you can put in. Yep. Yep. So let's talk about design. And so life insurance does two things really, really well, but just not at the same time. And so life insurance can be a great tool to accumulate cash for your future self for retirement, for college, for any of these uses we've been talking about, it can also be a great tool for death benefit, but it does not maximize either one of those at the same time. Now, one of the things that we see in the industry a lot, you see that dotted line going right down the middle. That's how a lot of insurance agents and producers are trained to sell life insurance. It's to fund with minimally efficient for cash and death benefit because you get a little bit of both, but you're not maximizing your return on either. And so in theory, if you wanna maximize your return on the cash value component of the policy, then you should buy as little death benefit as you have to, to stay under that top blue line, which we call IRC section 7702, which Dave mentioned earlier, we wanna carry as little death benefit as we have to, and we wanna stuff as much cash into that thing as we can before we trip income taxations. And so that's one of the limits that the IRS places on us that keeps billionaires from buying a $100,000 policy and putting hundreds of millions of dollars into it. You have to maintain a relationship between the death benefit and the amount of premium that you put in, but we wanna maximize that relationship and carry as little death benefit as possible. And we'll get into that a little more here in a minute. Contrarily, when we're dealing with families that have already accumulated wealth, whether it be in a practice, a family business, or just building wealth through their corporate executive relationships and career, they may be looking at life insurance as a death benefit play. And so in that strategy, we wanna pay the insurance company as little money as we have to, to keep that death benefit in place. So we wanna fund it right along that bottom blue line to where if we give that company one less dollar, the policy actually lapses. And so if we can determine what the goal is, is it cash value for retirement and tax-free access to cash, or is it maximizing return on death benefit? And once we choose, then we push that premium schedule either up towards that top blue line or down towards that bottom blue line. 
Awesome. And Brian, talk about like if, if you're buying a policy for death benefit, what are some of the factors then that help maximize that policy yeah, for great, somebody great. that wants it for pure passing on money to that next generation? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the best time to pay premium, we always say is never, right? But the second best time to pay a life insurance premium is as late in your life as possible. So that's the first of the four things that we're going to talk about. If you think about it, when you write a check to the life insurance company and they have to turn right around and write a check back to your loved ones, your return on equity goes up, right? Because the insurance company has the use of your capital for a very short period of time. And so if we're structuring a policy for maximum ROI on death benefit, then a lot of times we'll use a structure where premium goes in very, very late in life so that the majority of those premiums actually occur after life expectancy. So that if you happen to be one of the lucky ones that lives beyond life expectancy, well, you may have to pay some more premium, but your ROI on that policy is going to be much better. The second thing that has an impact, obviously, is the amount of premium that you pay. We're going to get into a couple of different design structures here in a second, but the less money that you pay the insurance company for the same death benefit, well, that naturally increases your ROI. We think about a life insurance policy just like any other investment transaction, dollars in compared to dollars out. If I'm buying a commercial piece of real estate, if I'm buying a small business, if I'm making an investment in a liquid portfolio of stocks, it's all about how much money do I contribute? compared to how much return I or my loved ones receive. So the premium amount has a direct driver on ROI. Third thing is policy costs. Dave touched on this earlier, um, but life insurance is a very unique asset class. It's not like purchasing publicly traded stock, right? Where you can go to any broker on the street and basically get the same price. When you're buying life insurance, especially large amounts of life insurance, Going through a good underwriting process to be able to control the underlying policy costs can have a significant impact. So purchasing life insurance from a firm like Granite Harbor or Allison Wealth Management could actually get you a much different financial outcome than going to another firm that maybe doesn't have the same level of sophistication when it comes to navigating the market and underwriting for the best offer. And then the final thing that has an impact on death benefit, obviously, is how the cash is treated inside the policy. So how interest is credited to the cash that sets inside the policy, the higher the interest credit, the less out of pocket money you have to contribute to keep the death benefit in place. And so we look at how that cash value is treated over time. Now, conversely, if we look at factors that drive return on cash value, Let's think about that for a second. So now we're funding towards that top blue line that we talked about a second ago. Well, the timing of premium there is flip-flopped, right? We want the most amount of premium going into that policy as early as possible so that we can take advantage of the time value of money and compounding interest within a tax-free environment. And so we want to put as much cash into that policy as early as possible to get those tax advantages. Same thing with death benefit, except now we want to minimize the costs, right? Because when you're making an investment into a life insurance policy, effectively what you're doing is you're just trading taxes for insurance costs. And so if we can minimize your insurance costs, then we're going to make that transaction a much more attractive one from an ROI perspective. And then the same thing with policy costs and interest credits um, will drive that return up on a cash value design. And Brian, I just wanted to touch that last one on interest credits goes back to that one of the first slides that we showed of the risk return spectrum from right. GUL, like cash, not going to have high interest credits. Then you go through that spectrum all the way to the far right hand side of variable universal life, right, right. which is invested directly in the stock market. You could have very high interest credits, but what else could happen with the stock market? it could go down. And so that's why it's so important to understand your risk tolerance and the impact of the variability of returns and how that could impact both your cash value if it's an attempt to build tax-free income for yourself in your life, 
or your death benefit if it's to build a tax-free death benefit for your loved ones. Correct. And I think it's worth mentioning there, Dave, that no policy structure is necessarily better than the other, right? You want to make sure that you work with a firm that has access to the entire market, right? Um, and so if you are that risk taker that you really want to take you know, on your own investment risk and assume that for some higher return potential, then you should be able to do that. But you should also be able to access those safer, more secure investment structures from an insurance perspective as well. So I just want to mention that. So this is one of my favorite slides. If you think about life insurance as an asset class, just like private equity or stock market investments or bonds, it's just another asset class that doesn't correlate with anything else that you could own. And so if you happen to be one of the unlucky ones that doesn't live to life expectancy, which is that mustard colored line right there in the middle of your screen, well, if you happen to make it up to about 10 years up to your life expectancy, well, then the good news is your life insurance investment is going to give you private equity like returns in that scenario. Let's say that you're within 10 years of life expectancy. Well, the all likelihood you're going to have a stock market balanced portfolio like return experience. So really solid return, but not correlated with any other investments that you could be making. And then if you happen to be one of the lucky ones that lives well beyond life expectancy, well, you got a decent bond portfolio out of the deal. And, you know, you got to live 20, 30 years beyond life expectancy just to perform as poorly as the bond market is performing today. And so even if you happen to be one of those really lucky ones that lives to 100, life insurance can still provide a very attractive rate of return. Absolutely. And now, Brian, the next thing that I just want to uh, share with the group here is there's so many different ways to design these policies strategically. Like, as you mentioned earlier, working with an advanced life insurance professional, an advisor, somebody who's a fiduciary, as we saw and introduced earlier, both Ryan and I are certified financial planners. Again, fiduciaries working on behalf of our client to help design the policies in the most efficient manner. Uh, we don't need to dive too deep in the weeds here because this is so specific based on client scenario, but let's just walk through and show everyone here a couple yeah. of, of examples of how to fund these policies. Absolutely. So this first one that you see is what we call a level pay design, and it is the most common design that you see in the industry. It's probably what you've experienced if you've purchased life insurance in the past, whether it be term or permanent. So in this particular set of circumstances, we're talking about a permanent policy where you're paying the same exact premium every single year for the rest of your life. And what happens is that dark black line that you see kind of go up exponentially over time, that's the underlying cost. And so the biggest takeaway from these next few slides, if you remember nothing else, is to remember that premium does not equal cost. Premium equals what you choose to put into the policy. Cost is the underlying drag that's coming out of the policy. And so you see in this scenario, you've got a green line that's significantly over the underlying cost for a long time. And then at some point, there's a crossover where the cost of the coverage goes up beyond what you're actually putting in. And then that cash value supplements the cost long term. Now, remember, we talked earlier about that level pay design right down the middle of the road. Well, that's not really the most cost effective way to fund your policy but it's predictable, it's knowable. And if you like consistency, then this could be a good solution for you. Contrary to that, you've got all kinds of different premium structures that you can make, especially in what's called a universal life policy. The definition of universal, anytime you see that word universal in any type of policy structure, that means you have flexible premium, adjustable life. That's the technical definition of universal life is you have flexible premium. And so this is just showing you a scenario of somebody that has uneven cash flows in their business. And let's say they have a really good couple of years and they want to overfund for a while. And then they want to underfund for a few years. As long as you choose a, po a policy structure that gives you that flexibility, then you can fund pretty much all over the map according to when you have cash flow available. 
And then let's say that we're really looking at maximizing ROI on death benefit. Well, you remember we said fund right along that bottom blue line? Well, if you're really doing that, then you should be funding right along this cost of insurance line because you're giving the insurance company just enough to keep that policy in place. Now, one of the really popular designs we use for estate planning is something that we call a skip fund design. So let's take a hypothetical uh, practicing physician that reaches his retirement or her retirement and gets a, an equity buyout and has a large lump sum of cash and would like to sort of front load their estate and wealth transfer plan and then not have to worry about funding for a while. That's what this skip design is so good at doing. You can drop in a lump sum early on, allows you to spend your capital in other areas like vacation and travel or reinvesting in your business. And then as you approach life expectancy, you can choose to catch those premiums up down the road. We have a ton of extremely wealthy families that use this design because it absolutely drives the ROI through the roof. So let's jump into a few examples here. And again, these aren't going to be the extremely advanced or sophisticated ones. These are ones kind of right down the middle of the road. Let's assume we had a 43-year-old female, preferred non-tobacco user, and she wanted to purchase $500,000 of permanent death benefit. That's going to pay out in any year, whether she lives till 80, 90, 100, or 110. Well, for her, it would cost about $2,800 a year paid in until she's age 100, and that would secure her the half a million dollars of death benefit. Now, to go back to some of those ROI numbers that Brian mentioned earlier, right, if she were to prematurely pass away in her 50s or 60s, you're talking private equity like returns, 50 or 50% 50 IRR, 18% IRR. If she were to live until her 70s, 80s, or 90s, it's going to be more like 9, 8, 7%. If she lived all the way till age 100, it's a 3.5% internal rate of return, tax-free, that bond-like return Brian mentioned. Now, if we flip the script and we designed it the other way, where we wanted to minimize the death benefit, but maximize the cash value buildup, Here's an example where this same female, 43-year-old, dumps $25,000 a year into a policy that provides almost a $500,000 death benefit. So think about it. In the death benefit policy, $2,800 to buy $500,000. In the cash value policy, $25,000 a year for 10 years. We want to get that in as quick as possible but keep it within the IRS limits of that formula Brian mentioned to make sure it's still tax-free. And you can see her cash value in year 11 projected to be about 300 grand. By the time she's 62, a little under 500,000. You could see column seven is the death benefit. That death benefit grows while we're funding it, but once we're done stuffing premium into it, we freeze that death benefit. In some cases, we even lower it because we're trying to minimize the cost of insurance and the drag of insurance cost coming out of the cash value. Now you can see when this client gets to retirement age at 65, we can start taking money out of the policy in the form of withdrawals and loans. In this case, around $38,000 a year of tax-free income, all the way till she's age 100. Down there at the very bottom, this ledger runs to age 92 on this page. You can see we put in 250. We took out the 250 she put in, plus another 814 of policy loans. Over on the far right-hand column, you could see this policy has an internal rate of return of between five and 6% at these later ages in life, 92, 93, 94 years old, tax-free coming out to supplement income. Here's and another- worth, Go ahead, Brian. It's just worth mentioning in those rates of returns, that's before you can consider taxation, right? So you gotta gross that up to get you a tax equivalent return. 
I, I mean, if you get a 5% IRR and you're in a 30% bracket, it's the equivalent of over a 6.5%. And that's not including investment fees either. I mean, these rates of return are net of fees, expenses, and taxes if you're comparing it to institutional or professional money management also. Correct. Now, over here, this is a different example. This is if we were purchasing a policy to maximize long-term care coverage. Here's a client of mine. She was 58. We contributed about $8,400 a year, and that secured a $500,000 death benefit. To Brian's point earlier, we maximized this policy to put the least amount of premium in to guarantee the most amount of death benefit. That 500,000 is guaranteed till she's age 120, but if she were to need nursing home, home health care, assisted living, she could access that death benefit, $500,000 a year, income tax free. And so if I go to this next slide and we show the average life expectancy of around age 85, she would have put in 28 premium payments of about $8,000 to get a half a million dollar death benefit or long-term care benefit. So again, that's about a two to one benefit for what she put in a little more than a two to one to have the peace of mind. If she prematurely passed away, the rate of return would have been better. If she lives a long, healthy life that needs a nurse to come out to the house, she's got a half a million dollars of accessible long-term care funds. And so the last piece we just want to share as we're closing out here is there's different ways to own life insurance. You could own it as an individual. You could own it through a trust. And there's different types of trust. There's living revocable trust. Or there's trusts that are irrevocable life insurance trusts. It's called an ILIT, I-L-I-T. And there's some tax reasons and estate planning reasons of how you should consider how and why you own your insurance the way you do. And so this is a really important thing to consider. And then last but not least, I know Brian, your firm does a ton of this, active policy management and analysis. Many of you might own life insurance already. And after today, you might be thinking, do I own the right type of policy? Having your existing policies reviewed. We at our firm as well, manage life insurance policies, just like investment portfolios. There's ongoing review, ongoing analysis. There's all kinds of developments in the life insurance industry. Life expectancy has increased. Cost of insurance gets cheaper. You want to make sure you're not in an old policy paying way more than you potentially need to which yeah. isn't doing anything for you. It's not maximizing your death benefit or your cash value. Yeah. And so active policy management is incredibly important. Yeah, and I would, I would just echo that comment. You know, when you buy a life insurance policy, it's probably the longest term transaction you're going to enter into in your life, right? And so you want to make sure that you're partnered with a good insurance company, but also make sure that you're partnered with a good firm to manage that asset for you over time. And so as fiduciaries, you know, we take pride in that, just like Dave mentioned, you know, managing those types of assets, just like you manage any other investment asset in the portfolio. So Brian, your firm put together this great PDF that'll be available uh, throughout this course here. Just yeah. some of the summaries of what we spoke about using life insurance to transfer assets. So I appreciate you putting this together for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Just kind of keeping it simple, right? Again, trying to make the complex simple and fun <laughs> to the degree we can make life insurance conversations fun. Hopefully this was enjoyable. I'm incredibly thankful for the opportunity to, to be part of this, Dave and Rebecca and, and the rest of the team. Really appreciate you guys and uh, happy to answer any questions as we move along. Absolutely. Here's both Brian and I's contact info. We're always available if you need us or have a question on anything that we reviewed today or in general, happy to help. Thanks again, Brian, for joining us. And thanks to everyone for having us participate and share uh, a, a lot of years and years and years of collective wisdom and knowledge in advanced life insurance planning and structure.